Hey everybody, welcome back to Race of History. We're going to get into an infographics uh, video today on, it's called the biggest British military disaster in history, the Battle of Doiron. I would say that's a, that's a decently big overstatement, but it is something that, you know, the, the British struggled with this some in World War I, not just at Doiron, but at places like Gallipoli. Um, so we're going to get into this today and see kind of what they say. We just did Sabaton's The Valley of Death, which is about the Battles of Doiron. And so I'll put the link to that somewhere up there. Um, but let's get into it. The biggest British military disaster in history, sort of. It's February 1917, a dire time for the world. All across Europe, the armies of the Central Powers and the Entente, or Allied Powers, have ground to a halt. Neither side able to break through the other's formidable defenses. Thousands of miles of mud-filled trenches reeking of disease, blood, and other pestilences crisscross through the heart of Europe. Artillery barrages have brought storm fronts of high-velocity explosive shells across the land, leaving nothing in their wake but barren wastelands. Where just a few years ago vibrant forests and meadows spanned through the beautiful interior of Europe, now only barren wastelands remain, cemeteries for the millions of dead, most of which lie strewn about no man's land unburied. Human industry has churned out even greater weapons of war. But none seem to be able to break the deadlock that the Central Powers and the Allies find themselves in. Howitzers and gas both can't kill enough men to make any military breakthrough possible, and victories are measured in inches of barren land taken from the enemy, or simply hanging on to the ones you already have. The Allies are desperate for a breakthrough. Without one, they fear the war will only escalate and lock the world in a bloody stalemate for years yet to come, perhaps even decades. Across the Macedonian front, Serbia is threatening to collapse under pressure from Bulgaria, Germany, and other central powers. And the Allies see both a chance to aid a friendly nation and perhaps achieve the breakthrough they are so desperate for. The plan is simple. British troops will mass across a few hundred meters from the Bulgarian army, which they believe to be weaker than central forces across the French front. Under the cover of heavy artillery bombardments, they'll charge the Bulgarian positions and break through the trench defenses in the center, splitting Bulgarian forces in half and flank. Okay, so don't think there were heavy bombers and don't think there were tank battles at the Battle of Doiron. Um, that's kind of interesting. I can't tell what those other things are. But the tanks and bombers, that's... Uh, interesting um bombers at the time were not were not bombers in the way we think of them today it was a very different type of of even bomb that they were dropping um so that's that's interesting and then obviously we've talked about tanks in world war one and about how they have their you know their coming out party in world war one but like huge tank battles like this were, were, you know, they certainly were not happening between Bulgaria and, and the British, right? Um, and tanks of the time were complete hunks of shit that, that are really cool. They're really cool to look at and, and kind of trace what they were trying to do with early technology and stuff they really are a cool thing but they are very unreliable in a lot of cases they're super impractical in the way that they work um yeah it, it did not world war one battlefields did not look like world war two battlefields so kind of an interesting setup here also again the british have this idea in World War One specifically, which they kind of carry into World War Two, if we're being honest. But specifically in World War One, they had this idea w that why why would you go after you know the the uh, super dangerous healthy animal that being the German army. Instead, go after the small, weak, wounded animal that is, you know, the Austro-Hungarians, the Ottomans, the Bulgarians, like, basically anybody except 
the Germans, right? And so they do that throughout the war. They have these campaigns pop up here and there where they try to go after the weak link on the German side of things without actually fighting the Germans. And they were pretty unsuccessful across the board in, in those attempts. Flanking them in order to achieve a major... Yeah, but a World War I soldier would be much, much more afraid of a gas shell or, you know, something, a mustard gas, something of that sort versus a, a line of enemy tanks. Your breakthrough to the Balkans, though, the British would have to crush the Bulgarian defenders quickly before they could be reinforced from the north and before new defensive positions could be built to once more cage the British in. As the British began to mass for the battle, though, it was discovered that the Bulgarian positions were better fortified than they had been a year ago, and in order to soften those defenses up in anticipation of the main battle to come, the British ordered a massive artillery barrage that lasted for two days. Then, the on the 9th and 10th of February, the Allies launched probing attacks against the Bulgarian front, but these were easily repulsed by the defenders. On the 21st of February, a major advance was attempted. In order to better shore up the British position before its main assault, the British managed to make major gains over the course of two days, but then a major Bulgarian artillery barrage forced their retreat at the end of the second day. After trading thousands of lives, both sides still stood in deadlock. The battle to come would be bloody indeed. In order to try and break through the Bulgarian defenders, the British massed three divisions of infantry and their attached artillery creating a force of 43,000 men, 160 guns, 110 mortars, and 440 machine guns. The plan would be to concentrate all this power along a very small section of the front in order to put maximum pressure on the Bulgarians, and the main assault would be across a 5-6 to six kilometer section of the front near the town of Karetepe. Meanwhile, the Bulgarian intelligence services confirmed that the British were massing for a major attack, and immediately the single division holding that section of the front was reinforced, with a total of 30,000 men, 147 guns, 37 mortars, and 130 machine guns. The British may have outnumbered the Bulgarians, but as the defenders, the advantage was firmly on the Bulgarian side, and any military commander knows that when facing a heavily fortified enemy, you should never attack without at least a 3 to 1 advantage. That would mean that the British would have to bring up forces from further north, however, and intense fighting against the Germans prevented such a reshuffling of manpower. Reinforcing the Bulgarian assault would mean possibly allowing the Germans a breakthrough elsewhere, where 90,000 men should be heading into the battle against 30,000 defenders, only 45,000 would try to get the job done. The Bulgarians, meanwhile, were ever improving their defenses and splitting the defenses along the front into three zones of responsibility. The right zone of responsibility would run from the River Vardar to the Varovita Heights and span 13 kilometers and would be defended by a brigade consisting of six battalions of infantry backed up with 48 artillery pieces, 12 mortars, and 56 machine guns. The central zone of responsibility would run from the Varovita Heights to the Karakonzo Heights and was four kilometers wide and was defended by one regiment made up of three battalions of infantry only. The left zone of responsibility would run from Karakonzo Heights to Lake Doiron, was 9 kilometers wide, and was defended by one brigade made up of six battalions, 76 artillery pieces, 19 mortars, and 52 machine guns. With the main attack expected across the left zone of responsibility, most of the fire support was located with the Bulgarian 2nd Brigade located there, although artillery from the right zone of responsibility could easily aid if called upon. The Bulgarians also took the time to improve their defense fortifications, establishing two rows of continuous trenches that were up to 2 meters deep and ran between 200 and 1,000 meters apart from each other. If one trench was overwhelmed, the men could fall back and retreat to the second defensive line, rebuff the British advance, and retake the first trench in a counterattack. To make this tactical retreat possible, the trenches were connected by long passages that were too narrow for more than one man to move through at a time, thus making them useless for the advancing British if they took the first line of trenches, but perfect for a hasty retreat of the first line's defenders if need be. Telephone wires stretched out across the trenches through these linking tunnels also allowed commanders to keep in contact with each other and better organize the flow of supplies or reinforcements, or a retreat if need be. In the front of both of these trenches, the Bulgarians also stretched out a two-line system of wire entanglements. These were rows of barbed and concertina wire laid out in the path of advancing soldiers and meant to slow them down 
Featuring sharp pointed tips and bladed edges, the wires were difficult to cross without injury and would slow down attackers long enough for the defenders to pepper them with machine gun and rifle fire. Ahead of the first line of trenches, there were also additional smaller fortifications, mostly established as observation posts but featuring machine guns meant to mow down the first wave of attackers before retreating to the trenches. In between, Yeah, so this is pretty common as far as the setups for World War I defenses and trenches, right? You have sort of a defense in depth here, although it's certainly shallow depth. Um, with the multiple trench system, you have the communications there, you have the observation posts, which depending on where you are on the front will depend on how common those are and, and kind of how separated they are from the main defenses. But this is, this is pretty normal. You know, they, they had, tr they tried all sorts of shells and, and all all the belligerents tried all these different types of shells during the war to try to figure out what could remove barbed wire the best. Barbed wire is one of those things I've I've actually read not not the whole thing but like half of a book over the prevalence of barbed wire and its effectiveness on the on the front in World War 1 and you know, it's one of those things that barbed wire today seems extremely common and not dangerous at all and and just kind of like a regular thing. But at the time, it was a huge hindrance for a, a major offensive because there just wasn't a way to easily maneuver around it or through it. And so in a lot of cases, what ended up happening is you had these very small gaps that were blown open by a shell or whatever. And then the the men that were a, a part of the offensive would have to kind of all come together and slowly one by one or two by two or whatever, however big that gap is, they have to kind of fill in through that gap and then spread back out. And what happens? You end up with like a handful of these choke points where these gaps are and they just get mowed down by machine gun fire as people are trying to get through there. And so this is, you know, this is decently common for the fronts of World War I. And just like in most of the other offensives, you're at a huge disadvantage. If you look at the casualty numbers for the battles of World War I, you can almost exclusively go down the list and whoever has the most casualties, they were the ones on the offensive, right? Because it's just, the defensive was just the way you you kept from losing people. But of course, you couldn't just stay on the defensive all the time because you there was no, you couldn't win the war that way. You know, eventually Ludendorff has this idea that you can win the war that way and he starts his defense in depth strategy but for the majority of the war, the idea is you have to go on the offensive to win, but the casualties for going on the offensive are just almost incomprehensible. And so that's what the Bulgarians are doing here. They're laying out their defensive trench works, their defensive structures, and they're settling in for a, a major offensive. Between the two trenches, the Bulgarians had also prepared machine gun nests and artillery positions sunk down into the earth in order to protect the guns from counter-artillery fire, as well as concrete galleries that would allow defenders falling back to fire upon the British as they entered the first trenches, and caches of ammunition for retreating defenders to reload on their way to the second trenches. Just in case the worst came to pass and the British managed to make a breakthrough, yet another line of defensive fortifications was being constructed 2-5 to five kilometers to the rear of the second trenches, but ultimately they would prove needless and were never completed. On April 22nd, the British finally made their first attempt to break through the Bulgarian front. For four days, the British guns laid down a non-stop artillery barrage that expended over 100,000 shells, all crashing down on the first line of Bulgarian defenses. The blistering barrage destroyed parts of the first line of trenches, but did little to compromise their effectiveness. For their part, the Bulgarians returned fire with their own artillery and fired a counter-barrage of over 10,000 shells on the British troops. 
On the night of April 24th, thousands of British soldiers roared out of their trenches and ran straight into the teeth of heavy Bulgarian defensive fire across the left front, exactly as predicted by the Bulgarians. Machine gun positions raked across the charging British, and German ships located on the coast just a few kilometers away lent their fire to the battle. Yet the 12 companies of British soldiers managed to break through the first line of Bulgarian defenses along several strategic points, only for a brutal counterattack by Bulgarian defenders to force the British to withdraw at 8 p.m. Meanwhile, British infantry attacked across the right and central fronts as well, initially to great success until the Bulgarian infantry called for massive fire support from their big guns. The artillery pieces of the defenders leveled hundreds of high-explosive rounds at the charging waves of British soldiers, often raining fire down just meters away from the first offensive line. What seemed to be a British victory was quickly turned into a defeat by the sheer amount of firepower leveled against them by the Bulgarian guns, and the British infantry was forced to retreat back to their own trenches. A furious, vengeful barrage from the British tried to destroy the Bulgarian artillery, but with most of their pieces lying safely and sunk in defensive positions, the fire missions did little to diminish the power of the Bulgarian artillery. Over the next two days, the British would try again and again to break through, but would face defeat each time, finally falling back to lick their wounds. Despite heavy casualties, the Bulgarian defenders immediately began to reconstruct their destroyed fortifications, managing to make the first line of trenches defensible again in a matter of days, should another attack be forthcoming. British High Command, meanwhile, was less than pleased with the results of the Doiron breakthrough, and insisted that one final push be made by the weary and badly wounded troops. This time, German naval power would be chased away by British ships, so at least the attackers would only have to contend with the Bulgarian guns. On the 8th of May, the British began an eight-hour artillery barrage against the Bulgarians, expending thousands of rounds of ammunition. At 9 p.m., British infantry once more leapt out of their trenches and ran across the thousand meters or so of no man's land separating the two sides. Yeah, so again, this is one of those things that's common in World War I where you have these ever greater just massive bombardments of artillery to quote-unquote soften up enemy positions, although you know, with with mixed success, depending on the battle. But then you have things like creeping barrages, where artillery is basically laying down a solid line of fire that slowly creeps forward, and the infantry gets out of the trenches and kind of follows in, blocked from sight by this creeping barrage as it goes. It was extremely dangerous, Artillery fire had to be extremely precise or you were going to shoot your own men. But it was another one of the tactics that was come up with. Am I crazy? I keep seeing tanks on both sides of this. Am, am, I, am I crazy? Did the, were the Bulgarians using tanks in World War I and I'm, I'm just losing my mind? Because I thought that that was not a thing. But they've had like dozens of tanks on their side of this battle throughout like the whole thing so I'm, I'm gonna have to look this up because i'm starting to feel like i'm crazy five waves of british infantry were met with the withering machine gun and artillery fire of the bulgarian defenders and though the attackers managed to achieve significant breakthroughs across parts of the front they were repulsed each time by vicious counterattacks. At last, the British were forced to retreat once more to their trenches, hounded the entire way by Bulgarian artillery, which would get... Did the British even use tanks at Doiron? Or was this an entire tankless battle? Somebody please let me know before I, like, have an aneurysm about the tanks. Continued to fire in a bitter exchange between themselves and the British guns for hours more during the night. In the end, the British were forced to abandon their attempts to rout the Bulgarian defenders and would suffer 12,000 dead, wounded or captured, 2,250 of which would be buried by the Bulgarian defenders who showed that even in the midst of war, there's always room for some basic humanity. For their part, the Bulgarians suffered 2,000 casualties, of which 900 would die from disease or wounds, a staggering disparity between theirs and British figures. This would only be the first in a series of battles across this same line of fortifications though, with each seeing the British assaults defeated time and time again by the Bulgarians. It would only be toward the end of the war that the British would steal themselves for yet another assault 
and find the Bulgarian defensive positions unmanned, the Bulgarian soldiers having pulled out due to the Serb and French advance further north. From out of the fire of the battle, one man in particular, Vladimir Vasov, would rise to prominence amongst the Bulgarians. His brilliant tactical sense would lead to the Bulgarian victories in this and the next two conflicts against the British across the same front, and for his efforts, he was promoted to Major General. In 1936, he was invited to an official state visit to England as the British Legion celebrated the British victory in World War I, and he was named as one of Britain's most worthy opponents. Being personally greeted by Lord Milne, former chief of the Imperial Staff, Vasov was told, It is a pleasure to meet the Bulgarian delegation, as even though we were enemies, you, like us, fought not only like brave men, but also like gentlemen. The British would go on to lower their flags in his honor, celebrating not just the man's military genius, but his honor shown on the battlefield with the treatment of captured POWs and the burial of dead British soldiers. Okay, so that was the biggest British military disaster in history, which I absolutely do not agree with, but the Battle of Doiran, obviously it talks about it. There's three, I believe, Battles of Doiran. Uh, eventually, by the end of the war, they all kind of look pretty similar. Um, British attack, limited success, they end up getting pushed back. And uh, again, it's, it's part of a broader thought process and strategy of the British in World War I. Doesn't really work out for them that well. Although you can see the line in logic, it just doesn't work out that well for them. So... Um, as always, like, comment, subscribe, help me keep building the channel over here. I will put the link to the Discord down below, and I will see you all next time.